Trying to get some, this is crazy up in here. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. The November 20th meeting of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission will now come to order. Um, it's good to see everyone. The first order of business is the approval of the commission agenda. Um, Ms. Bennett, do we have any uh, ad ad amendments or anything? Madam Chair, we do not have any amendments. I just want to note that we have one item for closed session that we may or may not get to depending on the amount of time that we have. Okay. Well, we'll endeavor to do so. Thank okay. you. Thank you. We, we also have the, uh, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, the ayes have it. We also have the approval of the commission minutes from October 16th. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed, the ayes have it. Um, general announcements. We have several, uh, uh, several important announcements today, so I have to take my time to go through this. The first is, it is National American Indian Heritage Month. We at the Commission embrace diversity. We, not, we do not just talk the talk, we walk the walk. We embrace everybody from all backgrounds, from all ages, all levels of ability. It is who we are. And this month we are celebrating National American Indian Heritage Month and we do so in earnest. Um, it is at, um, American Lung Cancer Awareness Month, um, Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month, and Stung Stomach Cancer Awareness Month. And we want to uh, remember those who have suffered with such ailments and those who have survived. And we also remind everyone to please take care of yourselves. Um, it is Worldwide Bereaved Siblings Month. Now, I know up here, and I know many of you out there have lost siblings. It hurts. It's not your child. It's not your spouse. It is someone that you love and you grew up with. It hurts. And we want to recognize you this month as well. It is Nationally Family Caregivers Month. Several of us have served as caregivers. I know I have. I know some up here have. I know Commissioner Geraldo is doing that right now. Several of us have done that, and we, we remember those who are caregivers for their family. Um, we celebrated Veterans Day. It was the 100th anniversary of the first Armistice Day created by Woodrow Wilson, President Woodrow Wilson. Um, this November 11th. And so here we celebrate a Veterans Day and it is so imperative that we honor our veterans. We are so deeply appreciative of the um, freedoms and the privileges and the rights that we, um, that we share and we have today because our veterans are on the front line all the time, whether they went overseas or not. All of you work so hard, so we honor those of you who served in the Navy, in the Army, in the Air Force, in the Marines, in the Coast Guards, and every other ancillary branch. We were so deeply appreciative, um, whether you served over there or not over there. Um, we owe you a huge debt of gratitude for all of those who succumb to the belief, do or die. Um, and we also, uh, we, the commission celebrated our vets at a commission event and also at a senior event for those, for those um, ages 60 and better. And those ages 60 and better went up to at least 100. <laughs> but I, I went and I spoke to them. And, and, and for those people in particular, many of them were fighting for a country because they believed in this country even though they didn't have the rights here. Um, but they so believed in their country. So I'm here saying that we owe every single one of our veterans um, a, um, a debt of gratitude. So can we congratulate our veterans? With, in earnest, I will also say that the month of November is Military Family Appreciation Month. Now, when we have our veterans who don their uniforms, who serve us, who fight for us, who protect our freedoms, their families are sacrificing as well. And we have families present in this room and families throughout the commission and families throughout our bi-county region who have endured sacrifice as well. They had, there were missed birthdays, there were missed um, anniversaries, there were missed school plays, all sorts of things of that nature, and plus the fear and worry and concern. So let's remember all the military families as well. Um, so thank you. I will point out also that it, uh, November 23rd is um, 
the Department of Parks and Recreation's Trot for a Turkey Day. That is where it's going to be at Watkins Park. They have a sneak preview of the Festival of Lights. And you get to walk through the park. You register. There's a small fee. And you register. And those registration fees go a long way to purchasing countless turkeys for families in need. We, par we partner with United Communities Against Poverty to make sure that as many um, families as need um, will have their turkeys. And I do believe um, last year we surpassed those in need. So I think we did a great job with that. Um, we also have um, uh, the annual Winter Festival of Lights at Prince George's Watkins Park, which starts November 29th through January 1st. The opening ceremony and employee rep reception is November 25th. We also have Montgomery County Parks um, Department Winter Garden Walkthrough Holiday Light Display at Brookside Gardens, also from November 22nd through December 31st. And employee preview night is on November 26th. We, um, we have other things. Um, uh, one Commission holiday event, December 6th, and we also have membership positions open for the Diversity Council, which is important for the reasons I stated initially. So please, if, if there's a website on, on um, your agenda, so you can um, sign up for that if you're interested. Um, also, I would say it is National Adoption Month. We have many people who here have been adopted or who have adopted, and what a great thing to do. What a great thing to do. And I know that our, at our Prince George's County Courthouse, there was a huge adoption ceremony where we had um, countless, a number of speakers who talked about their experience as adoptees or in adopting others. And there were actual some, actually some adoptions that took place there. And I will say that our, the president of the Prince George's County Bar Association was there and participated in this fabulous ceremony where these adoptions took place. And that president of the Bar Association is none other than our commissioner, Manny Giraldo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we wanted to congratulate him as well. Um, I do have two other several other announcements. We, we want to extend a congratulations to, to new daddy Dorner, who is uh, Commissioner Will Dorner, who has a brand new baby, Marianne. And uh, so he's out on fraternity leave right now, and, but we wish him well. And speaking of new babies, we also have Grandpa Geraldo, uh, also known as Bobo, for his new granddaughter, um, Madison. Yep. And so we want to congratulate him as well. Okay. <laughs> of course she is. Um, we are also pleased to announce that this is critical, that after a year-long search that seriously considered applicants from multiple states with uh, multiple screenings and final interviews, um, the Vice Chair Anderson and I have completed the search for the Commission's next Executive Director. So before we get to the new Executive Director, we need to take a huge moment to extend our thanks and appreciation, and hold all your applause, please, to our Acting Executive Director, the one inimitable Anju Bennett. Nice to hold your applause. Anju, Anju graciously agreed to take the helm for only a few months while making it very clear that she was not seeking the permanent job. She worked extraordinarily hard, which she has done for 30, how many years now? And 29, almost 30 years. OK. She's worked extremely hard, even in the midst of tough personal family circumstances. She did not slack off on the job. And that few months turned into just a little over a year, about a year. Um, she worked, uh, she earned the respect of so many people within the commission and external to the commission, and even played a vital role in the picking, in the choosing of her successor. So ladies and gentlemen, once again, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to Anju Bennett for stepping up in this capacity and, and navigating us forward, handling negotiations, policies, and everything else that you do. Please join me in giving Anju Bennett a hearty round of applause. Thank you. Can I say something about that? Sure you can. Yeah. Anju really uh, just proved what she's got. She is, I don't know anybody more dedicated to the commission or a harder worker. And uh, I just really appreciate it. She's been absolutely fantastic. 
Thank you, Andrew. May I share a few words? You may. Okay. Um, first of all, I have to really thank the commissioners for kind of having faith in me and asking me to step up. I, I think we were able to really continue the good work in between the uh, search and our former executive director. And I have to thank all of the commissioners. I was able to develop um, better working relationships with each of you, closer, and also the department directors. They were fantastic in, in their support. The deputies and the department directors, some of them being very new, um, it was wonderful working with them. And I really felt like they were part of the success. But I can't really, I couldn't have done this job without the support of the Bi-County officers and the Department of Human Resources staff. They're really dedicated. They're very, very hardworking. But Adrian and Joe, um, I can't say enough. They were really very helpful in kind of being there when I had a lot of questions, learning the job, and same with the staff. They're really very knowledgeable, and they were fantastic. And then I can't go without thanking um, the chair and vice chair, because uh, throughout the process, you gave really good advice, very sage wisdom and um, support. And I'm really grateful for that guidance. And I learned a lot in this job. And um, I'm really excited with our new executive director. We're excited on very, very ma on many levels, as, as the chair and vice chair know. But uh, she's extremely talented. I know you're going to be introducing her in a moment. But we will continue to provide all the support that's needed for the success of her vision and the success of the commission's vision. Thank you so very much, Andrew. So with that said, today we officially announce um, the appointment of Asantha Chang Smith as the brand new executive director of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. She serves as, she will serve as one of our three officers. Her resume is too long, her professional experience too comprehensive to exhaust all the details, but I'll just tell you a few things about her background. Over the past 12 years, she's worked on some of the highest levels of our state government, most recently as Chief Innovation Officer and before then Chief of Staff for the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development. Before joining DC, DHCD, she worked at the State House for five years as, as the Executive Director of the Maryland's Subcabinet on Base Realignment and Closure, better known as BRAC. In that role, she assumed frontline responsibility for managing Maryland's 3.5 billion, and yes, I did say billion, um, dollars, uh, the Dollar BRAC initiative, including creation of policies, programs, master plan, and communication strategies for the project. She had no blueprint. She devised the master plan and the pertinent steps. Per then Lieutenant Governor, now Congressman Anthony Brown, BRAC could not have succeeded without her. She also worked for Governor Glenn Denning as a special assistant for economic development and for Senator, United States Senator Mikulski as her special assistant on projects that include White Oak in Montgomery County and Andrews Air Force Base in Prince George's County. She has a great deal of experience working in IT management and holds a certification as project management professional from the PMI. She, is, she holds a bachelor's degree from Catholic University a master's degree in public affairs and communications from American University, an MBA, master's in business administration from the University of Maryland, and then completed the senior executives program at Harvard um, University's Kennedy School of Government. And she is a graduate of Eleanor Roosevelt High School in Prince George's oh. County. <laughs> Um, she's a resident of the regional district. She um, uh, has family in Montgomery County and Prince George's County, is tremendously familiar with both sides of the commission, and she lives with her family in Bowie. Uh, she's pleased to have her husband, Briar Smith, here with her today. He is a Marine Corps vet. What, what do you say? Who, what's it called? Hoorah. Hoorah. Is that, we're probably messing it up, but that's OK. So he's with her here today and celebrating. And, and we say happy Veterans Day to you too, sir. Um, and she has um, four children. And so commission and guests, please join us in welcoming, welcoming Asantha Chang Smith. We hope to get to know you better. I hope to get to know you better. Um, I have seen her in, 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 at work in um, some of these various capacities. So, so Asantha, please come on down. And, If you can please have a seat and, and, um, and just 
We, we wanted to say welcome to you. This was an arduous search, and we had many stellar candidates. So let me say that, too. We had outstanding candidates, and it was, it was difficult because of the caliber, but I think we, you had the diverse background that we needed, um, both from the government side, the state side, the regional district side, and, and just brought so much um, in terms of your innovation. So we look forward to working with you, and all of the other people that we know are look and at the commission are looking forward to working with you as well. And we offer you this time to share any comments you may have. Sure. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you very, very much. Um, commissioners, I am deeply, deeply honored to have been selected as your new executive director. And I look forward to working with each and every one of you, as well as staff. Um, as Betty kind of alluded to, I'm uh, locally grown. Um, and I grew up in Beltsville, and I have relatives in Rockville and Olney. So I really, truly consider myself a bi-county resident. Um, actually, I uh, have great affection for park and planning. Uh, my first job uh, was in uh, the 1980s. I was a volunteer at uh, the summer playgrounds. And uh, 20 years after that, I was working in the State House uh, for Governor Glendening and uh, worked closely with the Montgomery County and Prince George's County uh, planning departments on a lot of the land deals. And so I feel like you know I'm coming now full circle as your executive director. And I am looking forward to serving you, to serving the folks in the departments under you, and most importantly, the residents of Montgomery and Prince George's County. And I thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank, thank you so much. I, in looking at her background, I also wanted to point out, I mean, you, your family was dedicated to the Bi-County, to the region as well. And your mom taught both at Montgomery College and Prince George's Community College, right? Montgomery, Montgomery. Oh, absolutely. That's and, correct. And your dad taught at Howard University. Howard, he's an electrical engineer, yes. Yeah, so, so he was an electri yeah, electrical mm -hmm. engineer. So um, um, you are really Bi-County. Proud. Okay, absolutely. Red. So thank absolutely. you so very much. Okay. And please welcome her. Give her a welcome. Thank you. The next item on our agenda are we have committee minutes and board reports for informational purposes only. Um, unless there are any questions, we can just uh, move on. There's, there's no need for a vote. Um, we do have action and presentation items. So we have um, item 5A, resolution 19-20 for the Merit System Board. Chairman, so we, do we, we just need a motion? You just need a motion. <clears throat> Excuse me. You just need a motion on that item. Okay. So, so we need a motion for that. I know that's on page 21 of your agenda. Tan Tanya Up the Grove, she's served on, on for many, many years. Her bio is in there. Up the Grove Coleman, she's a senior human resources professional. She has done a superb job. So if there's, if, if there's um, not any questions, if there's a motion, can we move to approve? So approval. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Um, resolution 1922, actuarial evaluation presentation. So, Ms. Rose? Good morning. Good morning for the record, Andrea Rose, Administrator for the Employees Retirement System. And I'm here today with the folks from Chiron, uh, Janet Crana and Patrick Nelson. And we're here on behalf of the board to recommend approval of a resolution 19-22, which is the employer contribution for fiscal 2021. You know we come to you every year at this, this same time. Uh, the board conducts an annual actuarial uh, valuation to determine the funding requirements and to recommend an employer contribution to ensure sufficient assets are available to pay those promised benefits to all the members of the commission. So I think we have about 15 minutes, right, Betty? Um, um, so I'm going to turn it over to the experts and let them walk you through uh, this recommendation. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. All right, so I'm going to, we're going to uh, go through the results of the valuation. Um, one of the things that we like to do is, um, in order to put the valuation results in perspective, uh, we like to give a brief overview of the system so you understand how we got to where we are. We'll go through the results then, and then we'll follow up with some projections so that you know where you're headed in future years. 
I don't use a mouse, okay? Um, okay. Uh, this picture is, gives you a brief overview of our valuation process. Uh, the tank represents your retirement system, and uh, the goal is to fund that retirement system so that when members retire, there are sufficient funds to pay the retirement benefits for their lifetime. Going into the fund, you've got investment earnings on the assets, as well as employer and employee contributions. And coming out of the fund, you've got the benefits that you're paying to your members when they retire, as well as the expenses associated with running the system. Um, in the valuation process, we collect information on all the members who are included in the retirement system. Uh, we have your plan provisions, and we also are provided with asset information on your retirement system. From there, we apply economic assumptions and demographic assumptions. Uh, demographic assumptions are things that happen to people. When we expect your members to retire or terminate, uh, how long we expect them to uh, live and receive retirement benefits. Uh, so we, all that gets figured into our valuation programs. And we also apply economic assumptions. We need to understand what your investment rate of return is, as well as what salary increases are for your members, since your benefit is based on salary. Uh, we put all that into our models, and we're able to project the future benefit payments for the system. We discount that back with your investment rate of return, compare it to your assets, and from there we're able to determine what your employer contributions are for the upcoming year. Um, as actuaries, we are required to uh, determine what any material risks are to the plan and to monitor those risks to make sure that, again, you can sufficiently fund your plan. Uh, one of the risks we talk about is investment risk, uh, the potential for investment returns to be different than what you expected. Um, if your investment returns don't earn at least what you assumed, then you risk having contributions going up in the future. So we like to monitor investment risk and what your investment assumptions are. Uh, longevity risk and other demographic risks. This is the potential for your uh, mortality and other assumptions and experience to be different than expected. Are people living as long as we expected? Are they living longer? Uh, these all get figured into our models and something that we monitor from year to year. Uh, contribution risk is the risk that contributions will not adequately fund the system. Uh, so again, we look, to, we determine what your contributions are each year, and we monitor those to make sure that you're contributing those uh, su those sufficient contributions. Uh, plan change risk would be the risk that you amend the plan, um, and um, this would impact the measurements of the plan. So if you have any plan provisions or changes, um, are you going to adequately fund those plan changes as well? And finally, uh, assumption change risk. This is uh, similar to uh, some of the other risks, but that you know f the future might be different than expected. So again, we like to monitor all the assumptions that we use in our valuation program. Yes. The, the last assumption that you were speaking of. Oh, the uh, assumption change risk? Yeah. Uh, this would be um, uh, to the extent that experience is different than what we are and that we're, what, what we expected. So what we would do is um, every few years um, we do what we call an assumption study, and we review every assumption that's used in the valuation, uh, and we look to see what actually happened with what expected uh, was expected to happen, and we'll make recommendations to the retirement board if we think any of those assumptions uh, would need to be modified. Mm -hmm. okay. This next chart is a, <coughs> excuse me, a, uh, a look at the historical trends of the membership counts, the teal being the active counts of the system, the dark blue being in-pay participants, and the gray in the middle being the term vested, which are people who are uh, not continuing to work for the system but have not yet started their benefits either. Um, you can see that the active population has remained very steady over the past uh, seven, eight years, uh, only increasing about 3%, while the in-pay counts have increased over 40% uh, in that same period. Uh, this is a maturity factor that we like to look at, um, and we look at the support ratio. It's the number of inactives um, per active participant. Right now, we're at a support ratio of 0.89, so there's 0.89 inactive participants per active. Um, in industry red zone that we like to keep an eye on would uh, put that support ratio closer to 
2.5 inactives per active. Uh, so we're clearly not uh, anywhere near that. And you can see that the trend, it takes a long time for the um, support ratio to increase, but it is something that we will want to keep an eye on in the future. Uh, this next slide is looking at um, the, the system versus the entire industry. And this is an, uh, a survey of large state uh, and large county plans um, within the United States, about 120 plans in total. Uh, you can see that your support ratio is significantly lower than uh, the majority of the systems in the country. We're at about the 30th percentile. Um, so this is merely for comparative purposes uh, to show that um, this system is in a, a very good position and, and not in a, a position of concern um, when it comes to uh, population trends. This next slide is a look at the um, assets and liabilities over the past eight years. Uh, the gray bars being the liabilities of the system and the two lines across the top are the assets of the system. The gold bar is the market value that can be thought of as the money that's uh, in the bank, um, whereas we actually use a smoothed value of assets, um, which we refer to as the actuarial value of assets. Um, and this helps to smooth out any gains and losses and uh, reduces contribution volatility um, as the assets fluctuate from year to year. Uh, the percentages across the top are the um, funded ratios of uh, based on the actuarial value of assets, so the smoothed value. You can see that uh, the system has continued to improve their funded status over the past eight years, and we're currently at 93% funded. This next chart is again looking at uh, the system versus the industry as a whole. Uh, this is the discount rate, so this is the assumed, it can be thought of as the assumed investment return. Uh, what the system expects to return, uh, get on their the return on their assets. Um, for the 2019 valuation, we used an assumption of 6.85%. Uh, this is down in the 10 to 15th percentile. Uh, and when we couple that with a 93% funded ratio, uh, this system is in very good position compared to most of the systems around the country. A very high funded ratio uh, along with a low investment return is a very good position to be in. And uh, here's a look at the uh, system versus the industry as a whole in terms of funded ratio. Uh, again, at 93% funded on the actual value uh, basis. Uh, puts us in the 85th percentile. So top 15th percentile for discount rate, top 15th percentile for um, uh, for funded ratio it is a, a very good position um, and we like to stay there and, and obviously continue to improve as, as the best we can. Okay, these next few slides will show you the actual valuation results uh, for this valuation. Um, this slide shows you the member counts. So you've got a little over uh, 2,000 active members of the system. And your active members, as Patrick mentioned, have been relatively flat or slightly lower than in prior years. Um, on the other hand, the number of retirees and beneficiaries of the system has increased every year. And you have just over 1,600 retirees and beneficiaries currently in receipt of benefits. Uh, this slide compares your assets and liabilities of the system. Uh, a few highlights of the system or things to note is that the market value of assets had a return of 6.77% this year. Um, and that compares to the assumed rate of 6.9%. So um, just a little lower than what we were expecting. Um, as Patrick mentioned, we also use what we call an actuarial value of assets for valuation purposes, and that smooths out investment gains and losses over five years so that it lowers the volatility in your contributions from year to year. Uh, that returned 5.63%. Uh, so again, a slight uh, loss on investments of about $11.7 million for the year. Um, we had an actuarial loss of $9.1 million, and these are from assumptions being a little different than expected, and we'll look at how that breaks down in, a, in another slide. 
And finally, we reduced the discount rate from 6.9% to 6.85%. This is your investment rate of return. And when you lower the investment return, um, that causes the liabilities to increase. So it, it added about $5.9 million to the liabilities. So overall, um, your actuarial liability, uh, the value of the plan was uh, just over uh, $1 billion. Uh, you already have assets set aside of $963 million. Uh, so we're looking at an unfunded liability of $75.7 million, uh, which will be made up through amortization payments uh, each year. Uh, you have a funded ratio. If I compare your actuarial value of assets to the liabilities, uh, you're at uh, just under 93%. And when we compare that on a market value of assets, uh, about 94%. So again, the, the plan is in a very well-funded position. Uh, this slide just shows you how the liabilities changed from year to year. Uh, again, some of the things to highlight is we knew we changed the assumption, so uh, that increased the liability by just under $6 million. Um, we, um, we, there's something called benefits accumulated in other sources. Um, it looks big, but what that means is it's something that we expected. Every year, um, we expect there to be interest on the liability, and we also expect members to accrue benefits um, for the year because they have another year of service. So, um, so it looks like it's a large component, but it's something that we do expect from year to year in our valuation. Um, some of the uh, liability changes um, that are due to assumptions being different than expected, I mentioned it was $9.1 million. Uh, some of those sources that you'll see there, um, active member decrements, this is again people retiring or terminating different than what we expected. Um, retiree COLAs, um, members get a cost of living adjustment um, each year. That was a little bit different than what we had expected. Um, and the benefits that you paid out were a little different than what we expected. Uh, but again, the, the $9 million as an overall percent of the liability is relatively low. It was less than 1%. And what that means is that the assumptions are doing what we expected. So there's really no need to make any changes to those assumptions at this time. Uh, this next slide uh, shows you the membership and liability of the plan um, by each specific plan, plans A through plan E. Um, a couple things to highlight here. Uh, plan B has uh, most of the active and retiree membership of the plan, and um, as such, they also have a larger portion of the liability. Um, and another thing to highlight is plan A now only has retired members in the plan. <laughs> So it's just a retiree, um, only retired members, all the actives are now uh, retired. So just a couple things to point out on this slide. Um, this shows you a detailed look of your employer contributions by plan. Um, there's a couple different components to the contributions. One is the normal cost contribution, and this is uh, for the benefits that are accruing for your active members each year. Each year they're entitled to another year of service, so they get an accrual of benefits. The other component is your amortization payment, and this is to pay off your unfunded liability. It's paid off over a 15-year uh, period, and so those two components make up your contribution, which is... Uh, just over $22 million uh, this year, or about 13.9% of compensation. And finally, uh, we allocated that, comp co uh, that contribution uh, between non-police and park police. Uh, so your contribution for non-police is about uh, just over $18 million, and for park police, just under $4 million. The slide looks at uh, some projections of the system, uh, the top graph being the assets and liabilities, the, the bars being the liabilities with the, the asset line going across the top. The funded ratios at the, the top of the graph are, um, those are funding ratios based on the actuarial value of assets. The graph underneath it is the expected contributions uh, that will be needed. And this is, the, this is important to note that uh, we expect all of our assumptions to be met perfectly. That includes the 6.85% investment return and all of our demographic assumptions, including retirement termination. Uh, we all know that none of that will happen perfectly, um, so these numbers will vary a bit. Uh, but we have to give a, um, a best estimate of where things will be going. This would be it. The, 
The bottom graph shows the member contributions as the gray piece uh, increasing from seven to 12 million over the period and the gold piece on top um, starting at just over 22 million for this year, uh, increasing up to 25 by the end of the 20 year projection period. And I think one of the things uh, to note on, on these graphs is that there is a nice progression to get towards 100% funding, assuming you make your contributions. And as Patrick said, it does assume that the assumptions are all as expected. And this final slide is the projected cash flow. So uh, this just breaks down what we expect the contribution to be uh, based on its different pieces. The normal cost is the uh, benefits that are expected to accrue during the year. The amortization of the UAL, that's the unfunded liability. Um, so we'll be paying down the, the unfunded over 15-year uh, periods, and you can see that number decreasing throughout the projections. Estimated expenses are currently at 0.2% of liability. Uh, interest to the end of the year, and then the, it sums to the total employer contribution uh, that we'll be re recommending for each year. Again, this is assuming uh, everything hits right on, on target, so expect these numbers to vary each year as we uh, come in to pre uh, present the results. And then based on payroll, you can see the, the entire employer contribution from just under 14% this year uh, and hopefully trending down to about 10.5% over the 10-year period. Um, again, have to emphasize, you know, this is all based on the projections of the assumptions uh, uh, being as expected. That generally concludes our presentation. If there's any questions, we'd be happy to take them. Any, any questions at this time? Um, you know, we had this presentation a little earlier at the um, Employees Retirement um, uh, System, and um, it, it was very thorough then, very thorough here. And, and it looks like we're in good stead. They've obviously made a recommendation, and as our uh, Secretary Treasurer likes to point out, our health and wellness programs are really working here for the commission, <laughs> so so we are living a little longer, and you know, and there, there's a price to pay for that too, but we're healthier. So if there are no questions, um, is I just want to confirm what you said. We both had that presentation earlier, and it was uh, very thorough and uh, confident in your presentation. So um, if there are no other questions, um, thank you, uh, Ms. Crenna and, and Mr. Nelson, and, and uh, as always, Ms. Rose, and the entire ERS office. Please extend our kudos back to them, too. Um, is there a motion? I'll make a motion. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you so much. Thank you. OK. Our next presentation is a Manage Lanes update. And we have a special projects manager for the um, 495 I-270 uh, project, um, Carol Rubin, who's coming forward. And also, is um, Ms. Borden coming forward, too? Oh, there she is. Our, our new deputy general counsel, please come forward. And I know you have some I know you have some int introductions to make. Ms. Rubin, I know Good you morning. have some introductions to make as well. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce um, the, uh, the deputy, the director and deputy director of the M.SHA um, P3 office that are managing the project, Lisa Chaplin and Jeff Folden, and they will be making the presentation to you today. Uh, the purpose of the presentation uh, at this point is because you may recall that some time ago uh, the commission voted not to concur with the um, alternatives retained for detailed study uh, that we were as moving through the NEPA process on the managed lanes project. There have been uh, several changes. Uh, one is, and I'll let them go through it with you, uh, so that what M.SHA is now seeking is, is, is a reconcurrence. In our case, they would like, obviously, concurrence um, and an update on, on that uh, process right or in, on that point in the in the NEPA process and just as a reminder uh, there were four principal reasons that the Commission uh, voted not to concur I just want to um, set those out for you so that you have a context uh, the first one was that 
uh, there was a determination that, uh, or, uh, that the segmentation and phasing of the study area, which uh, starts, it actually goes around 495, starting at, at Route 5 in Prince George's County, and then all the way over the American Legion Bridge, and then up 270, stopping at 370. So there was some concern about um, how, and, and the project was being looked at as a single project. Uh, I think the commission's um, concerns were that felt that the first phase should be from the American Legion Bridge, including the bridge, all the way up the Western Carter um, into Frederick as a first phase, and then looking at 495 as a second phase and maybe a third phase. Um, there was also a question about the, the um, what is the, what is the termini, termini of the project. The first, that um, in Prince George's County, there was a concern that it was terminating at Route, at Route 5 and not going all the way to the bridge, to the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. And in Montgomery County, the concern was it was terminating at 370, not going all the way up uh, 270 into Frederick. Uh, the, the third point uh, or major uh, principle reason was that uh, there was an omitted from the original um, pre preliminary um, alternatives, there was a, there eliminated was any meaningful transit elements and transportation system demand uh, elements to the, or as to the, um, to the project, or actually as standalone alternatives, those were left out. Whether or not there are continuing to be elements, I'll, I'll let um, uh, Lisa and Jeff respond to that if you have questions. And then finally, um, there was a concern that the proposed um, alternatives that were moving forward had nearly identical footprints, so that the alternatives uh, were really the, the commission felt, you all felt, that they should be expanded in order to allow an adequate range of review for environmental uh, impact consideration, which is what uh, we believe that the purpose of NEPA is about. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over so, to, um, unless there's any um, questions. Can, yes, I have a question. Can you please repeat number two again? Number two was the, that the termini for the, for the project, there was some concern that in Prince George's County, the study area for the managed lane project stopped at Route 5 okay. in Prince George's, right. and that it stopped at 370. Um, okay, I thought that was number two. Oh, so the one was well, one, one and two, I, I, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. When I presented it, I kind of combined the two okay, because they were that's very what, related. Okay, got it. The, the, yes. the segmentation and phasing. Okay, got it. Yes. That's how I missed it. Okay, thank you. Okay. And, um, okay, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, good morning. My name is Lisa Choplin. As Carol introduced uh, me, I am the director of the I-495 and I-270 P3 program for the Maryland Department of Transportation State Highway Administration. And with me this morning is Jeff Fulton to my uh, right, who is our deputy director. Thank you for having us here this morning to provide the commission with an update on the P3 program. So I wanted to walk through the agenda very quickly. Um, and we actually are, are expanding on, on what Carol has said. It, it has been quite a while, uh, as you are well aware of, that we've been here in front of the commission. Um, we have been working with Maryland National staff, uh, Carol and, and Deborah and others, over the last year and a half. However, I believe it's been over a year since we've been here. We'd like to give you an update on where we stand with the alternatives retained for detailed study, including the decision, the recent decision by the Federal Highway Administration and MDOT SHA to drop Alternative 5 from further analysis, as it was deemed not to be a reasonable alternative based on traffic and uh, financial analysis. Uh, however, that being said, as we move forward with reasonable range of alternatives, we'd like to take some time to also discuss elements that we feel are common to all. Uh, additionally, in response to comment that was made by Maryland National, as well as others, to analyze an alternative that completely avoids the use of um, Maryland National Capital Planning Park Commission parkland on the top side of I-495, we developed and analyzed the Maryland 200 diversion alternative. Uh, it took three months to actually analyze that alternative, and we're here today to provide you all with the results um, of that analysis. Additionally, uh, MDOT SHA has been working to continue to refine the alternatives by incorporating avoidance and minimization measures where feasible. 
This includes in coordination with Maryland national staff over the last few months. We will discuss these measures later in the presentation, specifically to the three Maryland national owned Stream Valley parks. And then finally, we will discuss the schedule and next steps. So is, yes. okay, I was, will you answer? I can go back. <laughs> you answered part of my question right there. So this is a whole power. Do we have copies of this? I, mean, I don't see it here. Do you have copies of the presentation? Uh-huh. Uh, we did not bring extra hard copies. Okay, that's what I meant, hard yes. copies, for our purposes of our notes and things. No, okay, okay. I'm just sorry. wondering. Okay, yes. okay, thank you. So very quickly, um, I just want to run through the overall I-495 and I-270P3 program elements. Uh, it has been broken down into three uh, various studies. Uh, the I-495 and I-270 managed lane study, uh, which covers 48 miles, and this is the study that we've been working on since March of 2018, covers almost extensively all of the Capitol Beltway. Um, it actually starts on the west side, uh, down near the George Washington Memorial Parkway in Virginia. It includes the American Legion Bridge, covers the top side of the Capitol Beltway, and then ends just west of Maryland 5 in Prince George's County. It also includes I-27. Why? Why stop That's Managed lanes, why would, you stop, why would you stop at a couple of miles before Woodrow. National Harbor? So as what this, sense does it make? What's the justification? I, I'm, I'm going to answer your question, sir. Okay. Uh, this is a, over a 70 mile program that covers all of four, I-495 and I-270. When we initiated the first study, and, and we were looking at multiple studies that will ultimately come together, uh, the first study stopped at west of Maryland 5 because as we looked at the traffic analysis and where the major traffic was ingress and egress from the Capitol Beltway, that was where we saw the most extensive on the on the east side, the most extensive ingress, ingress and egress as it approached the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. Uh, additionally, so can I? Oh, let finish, me finish that. Sorry. Finish that. Sure. Additionally, the Virginia Department of Transportation, who uh, is currently focused on the west side of the Capitol Beltway with their I-495 next section, uh, they ultimately will be looking at the east or the bottom side of their cap of the Capitol Beltway in Virginia, where it goes from 95 to the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. But they have not even begun looking at that okay. from an environmental study standpoint. So we want to make sure that we're not we're, we're in um, in tandem with the. So in tandem, that's on their side of of, of the Woodrow Wilson well, Bridge. I guess I'm trying to figure out what does that do. Um, when you stop, uh, um, to follow up on Commissioner Geraldo's question, when you stop right there at Route 5 at Branch Avenue and you have the, the huge National Harbor development there approaching Woodrow Wilson Bridge, what does that create right there? What type of, does, what type of bottleneck or problem does that create right there? There's a bottleneck now. So anybody, did anybody so visit Prince George's County or uh, Alexandria? at the morning rush hour or the afternoon rush hour? Or is it just based on some makeup study? Because so I pass there every morning and it's packed. Okay, so let me just say this. We're, we're all gonna be very, very professional here. You have a job to do, we have a job to do. And we may not be perfectly in sync right now, but we're going we're gonna to try to work through this. I want to give you a chance to, to answer the questions um, we're, without any kind of accusations or anything. We want to give you the chance to answer questions, but understand that we have some. So, um, so, and, 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 so right now we had that question on the table. I think you were getting yeah, ready to was, answer. Just because I, we want to know what that does. What does that create right there? Okay. So what we do in our more detailed study we're going to be working on is we have to tie in everything back into existing conditions. So we've got to analyze downstream of Maryland 5 to the next interchange, and we've got to make any improvements in between there to ensure things still function so there won't be a bottleneck like you're saying. But as Lisa was noting, to actually go across the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, we've got to do the logical termini. And logical termini are not state lines. They're right. things like major destination points and generators. And really, when you look at the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, the 7.5 miles that was done previously is really a section unto itself, and we can't just do half of it. We've got to extend into Virginia and work with BDOT really to get into Virginia and over to 95 as a joint study. I, I can comment on that. I've been, I've been in transportation for 63 years. I've worked at MDOT and USDOT, DC, Montgomery County. 
Uh, if you look at the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, that was a very controversial issue from an environmental standpoint. I remember the Sierra Club thought it should be a tunnel, but it was constructed with 12 lanes, okay? And the uh, 11th and 12th lane was strong enough to actually take metro, uh, light rail, or bus rapid transit. So when you make that argument, the Beltway is eight lanes from five to the American Legion Bridge. You get, you know, 295 comes in there. You have the, so again, that part, you're up or be north of five, you're talking about adding four lanes to the eight lanes, and that's 12 lanes. And if you continue that towards the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, it would seem to match the 12 lanes on the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. I, I've worked for VDOT as well, uh, did talk to people there. They, you're right, they haven't, but I think the great example is the coordination that the secretary and governor have talked to the governor in Virginia. So really, it should have been a two-part thing to say that Virginia, besides looking at the uh, American Legion Bridge, we're looking at our side and we can have this project, the P3 in Prince George's County, go all the way to the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, and they'll take their action in Virginia. So what you've pulled together on the American Legion Bridge seems to be the model for the, you know, the Route 5 to the American Legion Bridge, and that's something I would ask you to consider. Yeah, yeah we, uh, we actually agree with you. We've talked to the VDOT commissioner and secretary, and that's discussions for next year. We're going to start working now. We've got the American Legion Bridge section kind of agreed with the capital boat. Well, I think if, you know, I think the commissioners from Prince George is in the community, they are concerned, and I think if that would be helpful, if you could clarify mm -hmm. that point. And we'll be happy to bring that comment and those concerns back to uh, the administrator and the secretary. Okay. It's not That's a new well. concern, though. So. No, yeah. no, I understand that. Okay, I'm, but you'll reiterate. We will reiterate it, yes. With emphasis. Yes. I, I think that's a concern that's been expressed since day one, since you made your initial presentation. And so I see it hasn't been given much weight. Okay. Um, as I said earlier, we're, every, we're all professionals. We want to hear what you have to say, but we also want to make sure that not only are you hearing what we're saying, that you're really listening and digesting the concerns that we're expressing as well. So oh, I, we're... We may intersperse questions into your presentation. You just have to accept that. But we will treat everyone with respect, and we're going to let you go forward with you. your, your presentation. Thank you. Uh, so let me just finish up quickly on this slide, which really, once again, just identifies the remaining um, uh, studies that uh, we have uh, underway and looking towards the future. So uh, I-270, is uh, part of the I-270 from I-370 South is part of the managed lane study. Uh, we have just initiated a preliminary planning or pre-NEPA activities, as we call them, uh, on the remainder of I-270 from 370 up to 70. And in fact, um, last week as well as this week, we are holding public workshops uh, in Montgomery County as well as Frederick County to uh, start uh, scoping discussions with the public. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, our managed lane study does tie into the Virginia Department of Transportation I-495 next uh, study that they are doing. And as mentioned, uh, the announcement uh, just uh, a week or so ago by both governors on how we will work uh, collaboratively in addressing the bottleneck at the American Legion Bridge. Ms. Choplin, I, good morning. I'm sorry. Yep. Um, I do have a question, and I've stated this before, that I thought that this part of the project was short-sighted. Is there any possibility of revisiting the I-270 effort? Um, one of the issues, and I've expressed this publicly, and I'll, I'll restate it here, is that the congestion on I-270 does not begin at exit 9 on 270. It actually begins further north in Urbana, Damascus, and Frederick. The traffic is not just um, vehicular automobile traffic, it is interstate traffic. We have tractor trailers as well as individuals who are traveling as far as West Virginia, Pennsylvania to get to work. And right now, I give this morning as an example, there was an accident in Urbana and individuals traveling on 270 South were held up from Urbana to the interchange with 495 going towards the American Legion Bridge. For us to focus on exit 9 and south only is a disservice to anyone who, who travels on 270. 
Whenever there is a breakdown on 270, and we've experienced three of them in the past four weeks, people take to the arterial roads, 355, where they can, Great Seneca Highway. 355, which is a state road, cannot sustain that type of traffic. So I ask that you reconsider. Okay. I, I would concur in that comments. I had the opportunity under uh, Gov uh, Secretary Flanagan to participate in an earlier I-270 P3. Uh, and again, 12 firms came in from around the world, including uh, Macquarie from uh, Australia. All of them felt they could move ahead, and this is several years back. I know that study, the CARDA study, has been going on perhaps for 25 years or so. And, and I think uh, Tina's point I would agree with. Uh, the other, from a standpoint of a P3, if you isolate that northern portion, to me there's a question whether there would be a enough revenue. Seems to me the strength of the potential revenue is the American Legion Bridge, the west side of the Beltway, uh, I-370 up to, uh, uh, I-270 up to 370, and then on up to uh, Interstate 70, and uh, they, you were talking at one time even about pieces of 15. You got traffic coming, as pointed out, from Pennsylvania and Hagerstown. So to me, that is a would be a large project. It could be segmented. But in terms of getting enough revenue for the northern part, I think you need the, the central part and certainly the American Legion Bridge. So I, I would suggest you look at that in terms of continuity of that project. Under Flanagan, all 12 said they could do the whole thing, all of 270. You've also done a Western Beltway study that State Highway did. There's information out of that that shows that the additional lanes there to match the bridge are workable. Uh, going back many years, uh, the bridge was, the American Legion Bridge was four lanes. There was a hole in the middle of the bridge, a gap. Uh, ramps coming on from both parkways compl complicated that. So the environmental issue was very simple. It was lane balance. So the bridge was closed. Hal Kassoff was instrumental in that at that time, and the, and the bridge is gone. Uh, if the bridge is stable structurally, uh, one of the problems is the grade going into Virginia and the grade going into Maryland. So to uh, widen that bridge or replicate that uh, wouldn't seem to do. I get a suggestion around the country, something a little more dramatic there could be helpful. Cable stay bridge, a separate bridge that would have enough lanes also for transit would be something that should be looked into the alternatives. But I, I support the comment that Tina made that you really need to look at all of that from the bridge on up to Frederick. Okay, understood. Um, we, I was gonna ask Jeff to talk a little bit about the I-270 ICM because we have seen and we believe there will be um, benefits that we expect to see that will alleviate the, the traffic there that will help I-270. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit if, if you'd like, or we can. <laughs> part of the beltway is the part from uh, the 270 where that meets over to the two part, that part in between Old Georgetown Road. That, that is something that, uh, I, well, I'll get into that a little bit later, but there's another comment. It, and just a, just a side note regarding the American Legion Bridge, and I, I, I appreciate all the, the, the comments you made. Um, that, that structure we have determined does need to be replaced under any model that we look at because it is nearing its service life. It was actually built in 1962. So it's um, it has been widened. I think it was widened in the 80s. And so it is at a point where um, if we are going to, uh, whoever is going to invest money in the, in this area, it, it needs to include the replacements. So I just want to clarify that. And I think the way you're approaching it, your additional comments are helpful for us. I mean, even for me, to understand that, that elements of it, that explains what you're doing. Again, looking at that, I did call Transurban once, and uh, you can a P3 can submit an unsolicited proposal to the state of Maryland, right and they are working in Virginia. That was one of my recommendations to do that. Uh, they, they elected not to. I don't know whether they, they want to just finish theirs, but again, I think you know, that's understanding it a little better if structurally you said that bridge needs to be replaced. Again, I would, you know, if we go to Charleston, South Carolina, uh, there's a beautiful cable stay bridge. So maybe looking at something that's dramatic, again, you would have pathways for people to go between the trails in the, in the two parts of the park. And again, providing, as you did on the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, 
that possible transit option. So you're really talking about two express lanes each way, but a, you know, a, a fifth and sixth that could accommodate transit, but also maybe perhaps walking across the bridge or biking across the bridge would be important elements as well. I, um, okay. um, Vice Chair uh, Anderson has uh, some questions as well, or comments sure. as well, thank you. Well, uh, since Jerry brought up, uh, I think a number of things he said, Jerry, make some assumptions about the economics of the project, and which may be valid, but I wanted to ask what uh, economic analysis you've done about the sensitivity of the of uh, demand to tolling on various parts of the of the project and what your assumptions are about which parts are necessary to subsidize other parts of the project. What work product have you produced or um, procured to support your analysis of what the economics of the project are? So we've done preliminary traffic and revenue analyses on the uh, managed lane study, so the 48 miles, and we've found of the alternatives retained for detailed study, three of them are financially uh, feasible, so they would not require any state subsidy, whereas two of the other alternatives retained for detailed study are uh, in the red, would require state subsidies to deliver. So we've done, for the managed lane study only, we've not done any traffic and revenue for the northern portion of 270 or the southern portion between five and the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. Um, could you share that analysis with us? Yeah, which two are not? Of you feel it. Hold on, hold on, Jerry. Uh, the, Sorry. Jerry, Jerry, hold on. Can you share that analysis with us? Could you provide it to us? We can uh, look, discuss that and look into it, yeah. Well, why wouldn't, you, why, why wouldn't you provide it to us? Well, there's procurement issues with uh, the solicitation of the developers and providing that information publicly. So okay, but we'd have to have a guarantee you, that that could not be disclosed you, under any circumstances. Okay, you made certain assertions about which alternatives are viable. So how can we engage in reasoned decision making about our uh, support or opposition for this project if we don't understand the basis for your, your, your assertions about the economics of the, of the project? I understand that that challenge, as Jeff said, we're, we're in a position where we need to um, make sure that we are sharing the information that we're able to share. We, uh, we share information through our, our, our IWIG, IWIG meetings uh, with our cooperating and participating agencies to the extent that we can. We are also in the process of developing the draft environmental in, uh, impact statement, which includes financial analysis that will be public, but at this time we'd have to take back. We're, we're not trying to um, not answer your question. What we're saying, uh, Commissioner, is that we, we need to see what capability we have in sharing that information now with you. And the EIS will be prepared before or after a contractor is selected? Uh, the EIS will be prepared and issued to the public well before selection of a developer. Then, then how can the economic information be com competition sensitive if it will be available before the contractor is selected? Because at this At this point, we need to look at what is what we can feel comfortable at this point providing to you from a public perspective. The well, DES. What does that have to do with comp the sensitivity to competition? I'm saying. I mean, that you said what you're comfortable providing. What I'm asking is, on what basis are you withholding that, other than you're not wanting to give it to us if the information is going to be publicly available before the procurement is concluded? The DES will not be public until uh, sometime this spring, late spring. So. I'm trying to be responsive to you now and seeing what we could provide to you as of this date. Well, so we would be uh, happy to take that question back and... Please consider that a formal request for the... Understood. ...for the work product that you have either produced internally or procured from consultants or outside sources or prospective bidders so we can understand what the moving parts are of the project in terms of the, what can be supported or not supported uh, financially. Excuse me, uh, Madam Chairman, for the for the record, Adrian Gardner, General Counsel. Um, Mr. Vice Chairman, if you'd like, um, I'd volunteer to put that in writing as well, follow up with that, um, and any other requests that the Commission makes today. Please. I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. I want to follow up on the economic part. Wait, wait, so, you, let me make sure, were you done? Okay. Commissioner, Commissioner Gervaldo. So, when you did the economic analysis, was there any provision in there for for working people 
who won't be able to afford your luxury lanes? Is there going to be any type of subsidy for the people who need it the most? So the economic analysis, uh, socioeconomic, is done as part of the NEPA process. Mm -hmm. uh, we can talk about that in a little in, further in the presentation. If you're... But my question is, is, was there any provision in determining the economics of the project giving rebates, tax incentives to working people? You know, the working people are the ones that need to get from point A to point B the most. They can't afford $35 for a, uh, for a ride, six exits or three exits as it is in Virginia. So what I want to know is what provision is being made to assist working people? To my knowledge, it is not part of the traffic and revenue analysis. So no, nothing in terms of a tax rebate, nothing in terms of a tax incentive for people that work. That, that earn $15 an hour, that earn $16 an hour, you, there's no provision there for that? So, it, so then in reality, what you're building are luxury lanes. Not managed lanes, luxury lanes. Yeah. Did you, uh, well, let me ask the question this way. You did some some revenue and traffic and revenue analysis. We've we've established that. Yes. What toll? What can you share with us information about what tolling? What toll levels were assumed in that traffic and revenue analysis? Uh, the toll levels are assumed to maintain a metric of a free flow trip of 45 mile hours or greater in the managed lanes. And so. What, no, and what are those tolls? I, I don't know the dollar range off the top of my head. It depends on the day, the day, the time, the section. There's. So I don't know those exact numbers. Well, okay, hold okay. on a second. But we, you, need, we need to but be you, able to hear. I'm but sorry, you, everyone. Thank in you. order to do traffic and revenue analysis, you had to provide some inputs mm -hmm. to the model. Right? Is that fair to say? You can't do a traffic and revenue analysis unless you have an assumption about what tolls you're going to charge. Well, the revenue, the TNR model spits out the the uh, the, tra the toll numbers to keep traffic flowing at a 45 mile or greater speed. So the entire model is based off of maintaining a free flow of speed, not in setting a toll rate and seeing what the speed is. Well, whether they're assumed as an input or they're the product of uh, some kind of algorithm that's intended to analyze what the toll levels have to be in order to maintain free flow, one way or the other, there has to be a, a dollars and cents figure attached to tolls. Isn't that right? Yeah, as I said, there is, and it depends so, on the section. So what I'm asking is, will you share those numbers with us, what the, what the, either the inputs were that were assumed or the outputs of the algorithm that calculated what tolls are necessary to keep the lanes running smoothly? Is that information you can share with us? Separate from the question of whether you're going to give us the other aspects of the economic analysis. We yes? Will, as we said, just some of the economic analysis, we will discuss that and come back to you with a response. Yeah. Well, and, and please, let me, let me just answer the question. Uh, please understand, similar to you have general counsel, we have general counsel. We cannot sit here today and commit to a request um, without going back for certain, what I would consider extremely sensitive information. We cannot uh, answer that question without having a conversation without our general counsel. Excuse me, we need to be able to hear. Um, we appreciate there's a lot of um, high, passion about this, and, and we understand that, and, and, and for very valid reasons. But we do need to hear and, and get our questions answered um, as best we can, which brings me to the, to the questions that, that um, Chair Anderson put on the table. Um, so the first one you said you needed to go back and just, um, because there, that may, the procurement issue um, you know, has some, may have some um, sensitivities and you'd have to talk with general counsel. The second one doesn't seem to me to, me to be as um, confidential in nature. But I hear you saying you still need to check. But I'm hoping that when you sit here and talking to us that you're checking in earnest and not, uh, because we, that's information that would really be helpful to us. The, uh, thank you, I appreciate that. The traffic, and, and just again to clarify, the traffic and revenue analysis, which Jeff was just speaking <laughs> of, that is information that uh, at the, standing here today we have not released. Um, and because it is sensitive information, it is information that could, um, we, we would not want to have out there uh, 
that there's concerns to have out there with the potential uh, future developers and concessionaires. So we will take that back to our general counsel. But I just wanted to and if that. And if by chance the answer, they cannot accommodate us, then come back with with another way to accommodate us as, be, as best they, as best he can. Understood. Can. Okay. Madam, uh, on Commissioner the current slide Bailey. that we have before us, I see that on the future study we have 495 for Maryland Pollard. Uh, when can we move future study to current study? Is there um, a time frame at all for that? We do not currently have a time frame. Again, as we, we discussed I mean, earlier, yeah, I, I, I'm being very honest with you. We do not currently have a time frame for that next study. Um, it is part of discussions that would need to occur with between the Virginia Department of Transportation and Maryland Department of Transportation and our secretary. So I, I we, don't know. we have not been given an indication of the time frame. Do you get a sense at all that it might happen? Oh, most, most definitely. I, I mean, I can tell you that um, from a system to system standpoint, uh, and it's not just what needs to be done in Virginia, I'm sorry, in Maryland, it includes what needs to be done in Virginia. I mean, this is a system of systems for all the Capitol Beltway for our, all of I-270. Um, so it is certainly an expectation that it will be done. I just can't, I don't have a date to, to give you. Ms. Choplin, me again. So I'm curious, based on what I've heard the chair and vice chair ask and your answers, how are you able to have these public meetings if you are not able to share information, and I'm not saying you need to go down to the pennies and nickels, but if any member of the public asks a question that requires a little further analysis, what's your answer? It depends, I appreciate the question, it depends on where we are in the study. So for example, the um, I-270 portion of the, the pre nipia activities that we're doing from I-370 to I-70, we just, we're not even officially in NEPA yet. So we, the public workshops that we're holding right now are really just to go out and ask the public what, um, to voice their concerns, their needs for that portion of I-270. On um, the managed lane study, over the course of the year, almost year and a half, two years now that we have had an active uh, NEPA study, depending on where we were in the study is the information that we share with them and, the, and soliciting the feedback from the public. So it really depends on where we are in the, in the study. With the draft environmental impact statement coming up uh, next spring, we will also be holding public hearings on the managed lane study. Um, and at that, when we issue the draft environmental impact, statement that will include um, information uh, that we have all the traffic analysis technical reports so it will include traffic technical reports reports noise technical reports um, environmental socioeconomic so it really and at that time we will solicit feedback from the public on those uh, on that document so it really depends on where we are in at uh, what point in the study um, it's a very uh, iterative mm -hmm. and long process I appreciate your um explanation I have to tell you as a member of the general public if I were not sitting as a commissioner I would have no confidence in what you just told me based on what you just shared with the chair and vice chair and I, I'm, I'm not trying to throw shade on you but I just I would want to know how you came up with the numbers and I understand there's competition um, and competitive but what you're in what I'm hearing is that you're going to force people to either go through the MPIA process asking Public Information Act to get this information, which is going to prolong getting the, the project moving forward. I, I, I got to echo, restate what the chair and vice chair said, figure out a way to get that data out. I assume then that Ms. Rubin and, oh gosh, uh, Ms. Borden, that you have not done any due diligence on the information that's being pre presented today. Well. You've not been able to do so. Is that a true statement? We. We have not gotten the technical reporting behind what is in the public uh, the uh, presentations that SHA has given to us. We've asked for a number of technical reports, including OD data, logical termini study, but we have not gotten anything like that. Okay, that's correct. Perhaps now would be a good time to ask what uh, information you've asked for, and exp if you could just, I don't. Need, know, know that we need every detail, but you said origin destination, 
logical termini. What what else? Uh, I understand CAD, CAD files. What else is? Yeah, we what have other, What them. other data requests are on the table from us that have not <clears throat> been provided? Um, and they, they, if I could clarify, most of them have been verbal requests during meetings that we've had so that we could follow up. We haven't put a, a, a formal request in writing yet. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, not quite true. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. We have. we have actually put requests in writing um, through email, and we haven't received. So we have our general counsel who, who is, you, or we can, we'd like to have some requests in writing. Is there some reason why we, we didn't do it more formally, just, just because the process has been somewhat informal? Is that it? Well, it's, an, it's not that it's been informal, but it's been as, as we Lord. are. There, there's so much going it's on in so many different areas of study that as we uh, have meetings with things like, for example, the CAD files that we've asked for have to do with mitigation requests. And as we've had, you know, we haven't had a lot of, of specific impact, you know, parkland impact mitigation uh, meetings. So as we, in those meetings, we, we've generally expected that those will be followed up with the information we've asked okay. for. It hasn't happened, but we will follow through okay, in so writing. Okay, so we're going to put something in specifically Absolutely. in writing, and, and so that you'll there'll be no confusion as to what our requests I, are. I, I would just like to add in uh, just clarification. Okay. I'm going to ask um, Carol to respond to this, but uh, because we have been working with uh, Maryland national staff, both Carol and Deborah, um, and. Quite frankly, my understanding from talking to my environmental team is re those discussions recently have been have been going fairly well, and that there is in, there is information that has been requested that we have shared. So I don't want there to be an impression that we get requests and we don't respond to them. My understanding that there is information regarding. Uh, I know we've had some discussion about property. Um, differences or whether uh, Maryland national property or other uh, uh, property and, and my understanding is that we we have been forthcoming so and providing saying, that information you're saying you were able to provide some responses some information not all. I just I and, just want to clarify and, that and I'm sure uh, hold on a second I'm sure that uh, Ms. Ru I see Ms. Rubin nodding her head yes yeah, yes okay. but what I think we're going to do is uh, Deborah and I will get together and make sure that we have a, a very comprehensive list of those of that information that we need because I will clarify that it took quite a while for us to get space uh, space files for GIS overlay which has been difficult to do we're very we're very constrained on the resources that we have to work on this on this program and respond to a lot I'm of sure. the requests and because of that we're, we're simply a lot of the information we're looking for is to help us Okay. Move forward. Well, and let's so see what I we would can say do. that there's a significant amount of information that we back up information and data that we okay. really do need. And so we will, instead of trying to piecemeal it right now at this meeting, we'll get together with our technical staffs and put a comprehensive list together of everything that we need in order to uh, respond to uh, to the meetings and move this project forward, forward okay. as we're trying to do. So let me say th let me say this. Um, I appreciate that that rather than do it piecemeal, that you're going to get those questions out. It, um, there may be more that arise as we go through this presentation. So we'll so we may have to add to it. Now. Um, also, um, I am concerned because you don't you don't have the resources, um, and we're going to. I'm willing to see what it is that we can do to be of assistance there to, with, with additional resources on our side. And, and uh, three or four, I think, um, we, you, were, you were saying that, um, Ms. Chap Chaplin, you were saying that um, the situation, the, the, the communication has improved and, uh, and the professionalism and communication amongst all of you has improved. And I, we're told that too. It had a long way to go though. So it still needs, you know, we're still on that road. Um, so further improvement is helpful. But from where you started, yes, there has been some improvement. Madam Chair, yes. uh, if I can, because I wanna make sure that the, the commissioners are all focused on um, the specific posture of the decision that's being made yes. today. And yes, I think that we'll definitely handle these data requests, uh, but, in, but to connect it to the decision that's being made, you're being asked to reconsider essentially your decision to not concur with the, with the um, 
uh, previous structure of the yards. I just want to make sure that I try to get it. Well, we, we believe that, but we're looking for the information that we need in order if precisely if to, to even consider changing that position. Well, Madam Chair, that's exactly what I was going to sort okay. of point out because okay. to some extent, and, and in this conversation, I did not want to miss the fact that, yes, okay. we'll complete the list of everything. Okay. One of the things that you should know that is of serious consequence is the information that's necessary to understand the stormwater management implications okay. for our Cap or Campton properties. And that has not been forthcoming. And so that's a category of things that I wanted to highlight for this purpose. And again, tying it to the context of the decision that's before you, it may very well be that we, we, it, it, there, there isn't an actually an option of making a decision to change your, your, your opinion because the information wasn't provided before and you still don't have it. So we'll continue to press okay. that point. Okay. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Geraldo. Has, uh, I know with the original plan, uh, there was no exit at the new uh, University of Maryland Hospital in Largo. So what consideration, has that changed? Are you going to put an exit there? Yeah, we've been coordinating with both uh, the Montgomery side and the Prince George's County planning side, and we've, uh, I think, agreed to put an exit at 202 to serve the hospital at this point. Okay. Not so at Arena Ms. Drive, Rubin? but at 202. There are environmental implications at Arena Drive and putting the exit there. That's why we've uh, looked at 202 instead. Okay, hold on. Yeah. Hold on. We see some confusion here. This is Deborah Borden. Uh, there's been a little confusion because we've had some verbal conversations indicating that that was being pulled back or somehow it was not going to be a full interchange at 202. So we're, 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 we're not really sure what's going on with that because we haven't seen anything in writing. Okay. Um, I know they're still looking at it and so we are still uh, expecting to, to have an answer on that, hopefully in writing somewhere. Um, but but we are still looking at that. Okay, so, so, so we're, oh, Mr. Let me say, we are going to need that in writing because yeah. we're very concerned about that. And we are, and whether it's 202 or Arena Drive, and we don't know what this environmental issue is with it necessarily. I don't anyway. Um, but there has to be an exit for the new hospital. The hospital. So so let me just maybe further clarify that. So over um, I don't know maybe the last six months or so. Uh, maybe more, we've been working with Montgomery County, Prince George's County, both the, the Departments of Transportation, Maryland National, in looking what we say are direct access points around all the managed lanes study. And so we looked at that independently first, and then we went out to Montgomery County um, DOT, we went out to Prince George's County DP, uh, DWT, we went to Maryland National and solicited their feedback, and those are some of the comments that we received. We then started looking at those particular areas, uh, looking at them from a traffic analysis standpoint, from an environmental analysis standpoint. So we're still doing that effort. So um, at this point, we've identified plus or minus, I think, 26 access, direct access points, which means you would come off the highway, you would actually come up to an interchange. Um, to access the, the, the location. So um, a lot of those are at existing interchanges today where we would, uh, we would provide a direct access point for the managed lanes. But I just wanted to clarify that that list has evolved over time based off of discussions that we've had with the local agencies, but we're not at a point where we can say emphatically yes or no, we're still doing that analysis. It, it, I, it makes absolutely no sense to have a brand new University of Maryland Hospital in Largo and not have an exit off of the managed lane if they get built into the hospital. Does it make sense? No, we, we understand that. It's, we need to look at uh, you know, that actual location to see how it works also with what's being um, evaluated through the developer. I mean, they, need, they need to coincide. They need to work together. When you say, what developer? From, G, from, a, from the... the the hospital. The, the hospital is there. The hospital is well, almost built. It's already up out of the ground. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost out of the ground. It's, I okay. mean, it is out of the ground. I may be confusing with another location. I'm sorry. Ooh. If I could, um, for one moment, I do know that this is your meeting, um, commissioners. Um, but there were two very, very specific purposes that uh, 
that the State Highway folks are here today, and we really want to make sure we get through those. Um, there, this project, as you all know, has many, many arms and legs. And so there are a lot of issues that are going to, that you're going to tap into about it, and if we could, we will follow through with those. But I, I think it would be really important to get through, uh, to allow uh, Ms. Chauvin so, and Mr. Folden to get through the presentation yeah. on those two issues, which is yeah, why the they, Alternative 5 why they and why, uh, the two, uh, why, why Alternative 5 is coming out of the ARDS and why the Maryland 200 diversionary uh, alternative is not being moved forward into the ARDS. Yep. So if we could, I, I just ask if we could kind of give them yes, a little please. bit of courtesy in that regard. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Carol. All right, so we did um, provide, in addition to those, we did want to give some other updates. So we'll try to go through those as quickly as possible to get specifically to Alternative 5 as well as um, the Maryland 200 diversion. We did want to just, since it has been a long time since we were here, we just wanted to remind um, everyone about the, the purpose and need for the managed lane study, which is to focus on obviously the congestion along the Capitol Beltway and I-270 and looking to improve trip reliability uh, and, and, and enhancing existing plan multimodal mobility and connectivity. And we do have a portion of our presentation does talk about the work that's been going on to to show uh, from a transit standpoint uh, the benefits that we see in this managed lane system. Um, so just want to clarify also that, uh, and we've gotten to this a little bit, but NEPA is a very formal process. It's a process. It's iterative. It's uh, written into federal regulations, the process that we must follow. Uh, and so uh, the purpose and need that we've established is the foundation of our environmental impact statement. Uh, it's key in determining uh, the range of alternatives that we look at. Um, and if we have an alternative that does not meet that purpose and need, then we are required to remove it from, um, from the list of alternatives. I also wanted to point out that not only Maryland Department, of State, uh, Maryland Department of Transportation State Highway Administration, we are the lead local agency, but the Federal Highway Administration is the lead federal agency. And so uh, we, both agencies are lead agencies on this, but we are doing this together. So, um, you know, and Federal Highway is here to also make sure that we are following the process. Uh, I won't go into a lot of detail here. It has been almost two years since we started this process. We've had three different sets of um, public workshops over that time where we initiated originally with 15 alternatives. We then screened those alternatives. Um, through a process, and we presented the screened al alternatives as well as the uh, recommended alternatives retained for detailed study. Um, that was during the spring of 2019. And where we are today is uh, we have uh, six alternatives retained for detailed study. So let's talk about um, Maryland 5. Uh, sorry, Maryland 5. Alternative 5, which is the one hot lane alternative. Uh, it consists of one hot lane on I-495 and a conversion of the existing HOV lane on I-270 to a hot lane. Uh, so as we were going through a detailed analysis, uh, this chart shows you the different traffic metrics that were used to analyze all of our alternatives, preliminary, uh, sorry, uh, recommended alternatives retained for detailed study. So on the left-hand side, you see all the traffic metrics that were used to analyze all these alternatives and, the, and how those supported the various criteria or needs that we had identified in the purpose and need. In this particular case, when we went through that um, alternative analysis or, or screening, we, um, the results showed that Alternative 5 uh, had the worst results uh, in comparison to all the other uh, screened alternatives. Um, so because of those results, uh, let me go back a slide, sorry. Um, we did also additional financial analysis that showed, showed that Alternative 5 was not a financially viable as it would require a substantial subsidy from the state. 
Uh, based on that information, it was determined by the Federal Highway Administration and the Maryland Department of Transportation, State Highway Administration, that it did not meet the purpose and need and therefore was not a reasonable alternative to be carried forward in the draft environmental impact statement. So let me emphasize that again, that as we looked not only at this alternative, but we looked at the other alternatives, we, we uh, looked at, at the traffic analysis and how they fared. We looked at environmental impacts, and we also looked at financial um, uh, analysis. And because Alternative 5 had the, um, the worst results from a traffic analysis, meaning it would not make any improvements to the, uh, the corridor, as well as from a financial analysis, that it would not be a, it was not um, financially viable. Let, well, uh, uh, let me just stop here sure. for just a second, if you don't mind. It would make no improvement to the corridor. It makes significantly lesser improvement to the corridor. It's it's less than okay. Significantly less, yes. So, but there's no denying that even one one additional lane in each direction would address congestion. Is that fair to say? Show us the purpose and need again, if you want you know, to sure. back it up. Um, one more slide. Okay. All right, the purpose and need is addresses congestion, improves triple liability, enhances existing and planned multimodal mobility and connectivity. One lane does address all those, albeit perhaps not as much as two lanes. Is that a true statement? Yes, but. OK, hold on. For NEPA purposes, my understanding of the law is, and our council can correct me I'm wrong, is that at the stage of the process where you're considering which, which alternatives to advance, the question is not what best meets the purpose and need, but what alternatives meet the purpose and need, and then to evaluate them in comparison to one another relative to environmental and other undesirable impacts. Is that correct? Th that is our reading of it. And I think what's, what's getting missed is that um, the additional element, which is something that we haven't been able to scrutinize, is the financial element. Because they're, in, in, in essence, they're. Relying... Yeah, let's park that one for a minute. Okay. But I'm just talking but about. Yes. So, yes. So you can see that one lane does address the elements of the purpose and need that's laid out for the project, but you're just saying it doesn't address as much as two lanes. No, we're saying it's not reasonable addressing the purpose and need. Not reasonable. It does not address what, the need. And what is the cut, what is the threshold by which you assess whether or not one lane addresses enough congestion, enough trip reliability, enough enhancements to existing and planned multimodal mobility and connectivity such that you can discard it or include it? Is there a how did you come up with the threshold? Is it X minutes of delay? Is it Y amount? I don't understand what the. I mean, we'll, by what by what measure is it reasonable to include or not include one lane versus two? So the metrics will we'll have those in detail later. In the ICC alternative, you can see both the all the screened alts plus the ICC diversion. But it's in our presentation. We're, okay. Which you just didn't get to yet. Is that what got, you're yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but before we leave that, and I think that I just wanted to say what. Our council pointed out, I think, also bears on this, which is it also your decision to discard it also relies on economic analysis that you're at least at this point unwilling to share with us. Is that correct? That's what you just said. It the financial analysis does play into an evaluation of the alternatives. Yes. Okay, but for in all, terms for of all the alternatives. in terms of our concurring or not concurring with your alternatives retained. We're not privy to any, whatever economic analysis you've done to justify that. Is that correct? I think that's what we just went over. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. We provided the results of the analysis where this was uh, about negative $600 million subsidy from the state, about two to three times more than any other alternative in the negative, and about a billion dollars, I think, less than the highest rated alternative from that perspective. So that's okay. all been provided to your staff through our interagency working group. If I could uh, address that, um, what, what Mr. Volda said was the results were provided. Um, and that's right. the you issue that we have is that we are not able conclusion. to. That's correct. We are not able, our staff is unable to do our due diligence to assure the commissioners 
that the conclusions that right. State Highway is is promulgating are in fact correct. It's not that we don't right. trust and, them, but we do well, feel the and, need to verify for the commissioners and because that's be our clear, job. You're, you're saying there's a six hundred million to billion dollar gap in favor of a two lane alternative or the uh, the whatever two lane alternative promote performs the best versus only one lane. Building two lanes is 600 to 100 million uh, to a billion dollars in effect more cost effective. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, there's a billion dollar a billion dollar okay. range roughly. Okay. Thank you. I I, I have a comment. Uh, okay. should I let you go through the presentation or you would you prefer that? Yeah. I, have well, a I don't know what your comment is. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I, get, I get two comments. In looking, you know, to make this, and I've been involved in environmental studies as well, but the, the, and I don't have your data, but I did my traffic analysis, and basically, you know, there's an issue of the, the charges for the tolls versus the time of the tolls. And the policy in Maryland is to not to have fixed tolls. The Maryland Transportation Authority seems to make money. They keep... Can they roll it over? They go to Wall Street. They get their funding. So they have kind of fixed tolls. I think one thing to me that would be a concern if we go to the Virginia model, where you have these variable tolls that, as mentioned earlier, winds up like at forty dollars an hour. I mean, so I, I think that's something. I don't know whether you have a policy. I think you should look at that policy, whether it's a fixed tolls with a longer P three time frame, or variable higher tolls. Well, P3, yeah, we'd like to get in and get out in 10 years or, you know, 20 years or 30 years. But these are sovereign banks from around the world investing for 50 to 100 years. So I think you should look at the policy, the governor, the secretary, your staff, uh, fixed tolls versus these variables. But the other thing, uh, getting to this alternate five, there could be different segments. It sounds like Prince George's County on their beltway would be interested in the model at Maryland 43, where you have put in toll lanes on the Kennedy Expressway, mm -hmm. and there's ramps up to the improved intersection. So maybe that's something there, and their land is more open on the side. So maybe that's something that fits there, where there's some variance. In terms of this five, maybe it just applies to the part in Montgomery County, which environmentally is very tight, and which residentially is very tight, but you're saying what's, it's the whole thing. It's 270 and that part of the Beltway and the, Mer and the part in Montgomery County. So I think there should be some variability in that. Five could be very applicable. And this, this is the Flanagan plan. This is what Flanagan proposed. It was trying to stay within the right way was add one and take two. The other thing, when you look at what they did in Virginia with the cones, versus the uh, Jersey walls. The flex it, posts. Yeah, posts versus the Jersey walls at 43, Maryland 43, or in, in California where the, the electronics or the GIS that we have, people that go out of the, a dashed line out of the toll lane and then back in, you certainly know, you know by monitoring that. So it kind of minimizes the impact on the park, abutting park, park property and abutting residential property. So maybe there's a variable in the, in the one-lane option. And personally, I see the one-lane option being, being tied to the ICC utilization. And when we're talking about ICC, we're talking about six miles. But if you're going 60, 70 miles on the ICC, that's, that's kind of immaterial. So I, I think the two part, one of the policy is, are you looking for fixed tolls or variable? And the other one is, could you segment the, the two-lane option a little bit? Maybe the part just in Montgomery County is the one-lane option. So it's just a suggestion. Okay. Okay. Um, Are there any other comments at this time? If not, we'll let you try to proceed a little more. Yes. Okay. Okay. Let me fast forward here. Um, so as we've... Continued in looking uh, at the alternatives retained for detailed study, and this is tied to visualize 2045, um, the National Capital Regional Transportation Planning Board's uh, seven aspirational initiatives, uh, which I-495 and I-270, uh, as well as uh, VDOT's um, uh, program is part of an under-expanding express highway network. We did want to, 
you know, this plan is a regional plan. It is, it covers more than just highway improvements. Um, and on the I-495 and I-270 managed lane study, uh, it is addressing multiple initiatives uh, aside from the expansion of the highway. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are including direct in, as well as indirect connections to transit centers uh, and transit-oriented development. And I do have a slide that I can quickly go through in, in a minute that shows that. Um, we are also, as part of our studies, looking at cross-highway pedestrian and bicycle uh, accommodations. Um, we're supporting travel options such as HOV, carpool, and vanpool, and bus transit. And again, I have a, a slide that talks about that, as well as opportunities for new and expanded transit service uh, provided uh, by the local and state transit providers. Um, I just want to, uh, as a baseline, uh, as we looked at all the alternatives retained for detailed study, as well as when Jeff uh, talks about the Maryland 200 diversion, um, all of those analysis were based on the 2040 MW COG model um, that includes all the projects in the console, uh, sorry, the constrained long range plan. Uh, we also used the 24 land use assumptions for MW COG, which were provided by each of the, uh, the counties. Um, since uh, the MW COG is being updated for 2045, we do admit that we have to do um, an update of our own analysis because we used 2040 and uh, we are in the process uh, of, of doing that as well. And we are incorporating um, additions that were made as part of the 2045 MW COG model that's listed on the slide. So I just wanted to mention that as, as an understanding of a baseline when we did our traffic analysis. Um, as far as the multimodal mobility and connectivity, uh, the, the MDOT uh, State Highway Administration, uh, we did hear concerns from the public, from Maryland National, as well as others regarding transit. And so as we've moved forward with alternatives retained for detailed studies, we've looked for every opportunity to improve the transit service. Um, the managed lanes uh, bridge the gap between roads and transit by providing an opportunity for an uh, economical way for transits to use the fixed uh, managed lane system. So what I mean by that is transit will be allowed to run on the managed lanes for free. Um, and that will give them a, a more reliable trip uh, for not only their service, but also for their customers. Um, We've talked about uh, the direct access points, but we also see the managed lanes as an opportunity to provide suburban transit markets or increased uh, suburban man man transit markets, um, potentially looking at Bethesda and Silver Springs to Tyson's from New Carrollton, Largo and Branch Avenue, National Harbor and Crystal City. So we're working with the various transit agencies um, through the managed lane study to see where opportunities exist for them to enhance the service that they are currently providing. Uh, the managed lanes also uh, provide incentives for both transit and ride shares uh, as the managed lanes improve trip times and reliability as I've, as I've mentioned. We're also through this effort looking at carpooling and existing um, park and ride lots and how we can um, provide a, better uh, connections through the direct uh, access points on the managed lane system. So this slide, it does not, I will say, it does not show all um, 26 direct connections. This was really meant to um, depict how we were tying into uh, some of the transit uh, centers. As I've mentioned uh, previously uh, in our presentation, they do include, or we have included right now, 26 potential direct access points um, that will be achieved either, either ramps or slip ramps. Uh, and 10 of those provide direct or indirect access to transit and TOD sites. And as mentioned before, we have been working and will continue to work with not only with Montgomery and Prince George's County, but also Maryland National in an effort to further refine these areas. On the uh, social equity side, as part of the environmental justice analysis of visualized 2045 equity emphasis areas, which are defined as census tracts with higher than average concentrations of low income or minority populations or both were established during the NEPA process uh, to help identify regional impacts on planned transportation projects. The MLS study will improve, the managed lane study, will improve mobility and accessibility to many of the identified 
equity emphasis areas by providing both the direct and indirect access to existing pr and proposed transit centers, uh, as well as supporting and encouraging alternative travel modes, such as either using HOV, carpool, or van pool. Uh, and we are continuing the, that process through the NEPA. Um, we've already talked about the American uh, Legion Bridge. As I mentioned, it was uh, constructed, or sorry, uh, opened in 1962. And, and since that time has seen an ex uh, exceptional and significant increase in travel. Um, all of our alternatives retained for detailed study include the replacement of the American Legion Bridge, as well as we are committing, committed to providing bicycle and pedestrian access across the bridge. I think that was mentioned earlier. Uh, and we are working with the Virginia Department of Transportation as well as the National Park Service in, in providing that connection. So that's in the process, but we have made that commitment. Um, I just have a couple questions about this, this, the bridge. Um, what is the difference in the project between the announcement that was made a week ago uh, and the project as it existed before? In other words, what is, the, what is Virginia's participation or agreement whatever it is they've committed to, how does that change the project? So we have been working with staff level on the Virginia Department of Transportation for the last uh, almost two years now. Uh, the difference in the, in the announcement that was made is that was an agreement between the two governors when it came from uh, a cost sharing. Uh, because the American Legion Bridge is part of our managed lane system, so when we did our cost estimating, we had to um, encounter or, or uh, take that all into account for that cost, yet it provides a benefit as well to Virginia and their managed lane system. So, uh, Okay, so Virginia contributes some money. They, are, they will be contributing, yes. All right. But this project has been advertised as not requiring any tax dollars from the beginning. Isn't that correct? That is correct. Okay. So if Virginia is contributing money and the project did not require any tax money to be contributed to be, to, to be viable, then doesn't Virginia's participation free up money for transit or other purposes? So, so it was announced by the governors, Virginia will be not necessarily, they'll be contributing money, future monies from toll revenue that they'll be receiving in Virginia. So that doesn't really free up money. They're, they're collecting the tolls going northbound well, at the American Legion wait, wait, wait. Bridge. Does that, their participation reduce costs to Maryland or not? No. Then what's the point? How does that help us? The, the cost is based off of the, um, and it's, it's, it's complex when it comes to the, the estimating cost of the project, as well as when we look at the potential traffic and revenue from the, the equity and debt that the developer has to come to and the future revenue. Um, and so it just, it reduces that, that equation, but it's not cost, it's not money that's coming in investment from the state regardless, from the state of Maryland. Well, if we, the bridge is in Maryland, no. Uh, point of clarification it's part of it. is the high water mark on the north on the south side of the so consequently some of the bridge is over land in Virginia. So I, I thought it was about twenty one percent or something exactly. was the ratio. Mm -hmm. So and it's the interchange with the part of the uh, GW Parkway that would be involved. And again, they're backing that up to where they have the toll lane. So so there's they have a share of the bridge. Perhaps that, is, that, that was true. Correct. Okay, so 79% yeah. of the bridge is in Maryland, right? So before right. Virginia agreed to contribute, we were going to absorb as part of the project the cost of... I would not say that, that we had not had those discussions with Virginia at that time. Mm -hmm. Okay, but your assumptions about the cost of the project prior to Virginia's agreement was that the toll revenue that we would collect, that we would have control over Maryland, would be sufficient to pay for the bridge. We assumed all the toll revenue between the George Washington Parkway into Maryland would be sufficient. The toll revenue in Virginia, obviously the GW Parkway to the bridge, is Virginia's technically. So they will be handling the tolling in the northbound direction, taking that revenue. We'll be handling the tolling in the southbound direction, taking that revenue. In the end, it's all no cost to the Commonwealth or the state of Maryland. Okay, but I'm trying to get at what is the difference in terms of the financial implications of the project to Maryland before and after Virginia's participation. First, you said that Virginia is going to be contributing financial resources to the project that will reduce the project's cost. 
And I said, I thought the project wasn't supposed to cost taxpayers anything to begin with, to which you then said, Be I'm not sure what. Because it's not, it is not a cost to the state of Maryland or taxpayers because the developers come with the debt and equity uh, to do the construction so does that mean operations that, that, and maintenance. Does that mean the, that the P3, prospective P3 bidders can expect to make more money on the project because Virginia is making a financial contribution? You have just said that Virginia's participation reduced their kicking in money. I'm asking who's the beneficiary of that money and why that money is not available to fund transit or some other purpose. So our original analysis assumed the tolls in Virginia were part of our overall analysis. So they you are assume, kicking in. Okay, they are so kicking in assume, any tolls in Virginia. They are kicking in the same thing we've always said. So you assumed Virginia was going to give us their toll revenue Correct. before. Ah, well, it's a good thing you've got agreement from Virginia, isn't it? Yes. Now, I don't. Please don't applaud or or laugh. Whether you agree with me or not, we just don't. No applauding or booing. Okay, let me do this. Um, we may have other comments, but we are—we now are at the point where we have some time constraints. Mm -hmm. So we have, um, so we may have some quorum issues shortly. So we are you right need? at the point in the in the presentation where Jeff is going to walk through the Maryland 200 diversion. Okay, and, and that, that show that will also show the um, the evaluation that was done okay. as the, and it includes um, alternative. I'm, I'm not sure we're going to get to a vote today. Well, okay, okay, okay. That's, that's okay. fine. Okay, yeah. so, all right, all right. Um, okay, Jeff. Right. And it's folded or hold? Folded with an folded. F. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, so the development analysis of the 200 diversion alternative was completed in an effort to be responsive to agency concerns and comments about evaluating an alternative that avoided the sensitive resources along the top side of the Capitol Beltway. So that, those agencies included the National Capital Planning Commission, the respective Departments of Transportation of Montgomery and Prince George's Counties, and Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission staff. So after we collectively agreed to the scope with the, all the agencies, we took a hard look at the 200 diversion alternative over a three-month period and analyzed it to the same level as the screened alternatives. The analysis was done to determine if the 200 diversion alternative met the transportation purpose and need of the managing study and should be carried forward as a reasonable alternative in the draft environmental impact statement. Uh, so this graphic shows potential travel routes that may be diverted from the top side of the Capitol Beltway to the ICC. Just want to take a minute to go through a couple of those routes. The first route in green would be traffic traveling between the 95 corridor north of the ICC and across the American Legion Bridge into Northern Virginia. So this traffic accounts for about 15% of the westbound traffic on the top side of the Beltway today. So traffic utilizing the ICC to reach Northern Virginia would increase a person's travel distance by about 10 miles, which is about a 50% increase in distance. The next route in blue would be traffic traveling on the outer loop of the Beltway in Prince George's County traveling in Northern Virginia across the Legion Bridge. The traffic accounts for 6% of the westbound traffic on the top side of the Beltway in the morning peak period. So if traffic coming from Prince George's County were to utilize 95 in the ICC instead of the Beltway, to reach Northern Virginia, it would take a person's trip increase by 19 miles, which is about two and a half times increase in distance. Yeah, I, I've done that too, so the, those are my sketches. Okay. The same thing you've done. <laughs> so my mask's good? Close enough? <laughs> you're, you're correct, yes. Okay. Okay. Appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to keep going. Okay. Uh, so either movement would require significant additional travel distance to reach a person's destination. And it requires significant congestion on the top side of the beltway to make it a time viable alternative. So now we've talked about the movements for the diversion alternative. I want to explain what the alternative assumes. So the 200 diversion alternative is similar to alternative 9, which considers adding two hot lanes in each direction on the entire Capitol Beltway and 270 in the study area. The 200 diversion alternative still proposes those two hot lanes in each direction as highlighted in green on the map. However, instead of the two hot lanes on the top side of the beltway, the 200 diversion alternative proposed transportation system management solutions, including ramp metering and signal optimization, to improve traffic flow on the top side without any widening. The 200 diversion alternative also connects the ICC to the hot lanes proposed on the east side of 495 with two hot lanes in each direction on 95 for about four miles. So ramp metering and signal timing were found to be feasible transportation system management solutions to implement on the top side of the beltway. But these solutions would not be enough to address the long-term traffic of the corridor. We also looked at using the shoulders as travel lanes during peak periods to accommodate traffic. However, this was not found to be a feasible option due to the shoulder widths and geometry in many locations of the beltway do not accommodate uh, traffic safely. 
So this next slide shows a kind of an analysis of that shoulder option. So to use shoulders as travel lanes during peak periods, they have to be wide enough and have adequate horizontal sight distance so people can safely stop. As you can see on the top of the map, everywhere highlighted in orange has median shoulders in the middle that are too narrow to accommodate traffic using the shoulders. Everywhere in pink has outside shoulders that are too narrow to accommodate travel on the shoulder. The bottom map shows where horizontal sight distance is not adequate to accommodate peak shoulder usage. Blue shows where the inside shoulders do not have adequate sight distance, and green shows where the outside shoulder sight distance is not adequate to safely use the shoulders for travel. It takes significant work, including widening the capital beltway to provide adequate width and sight distance both, so the shoulders could be utilized for travel. This would still impact potentially homes and parkland while not addressing the long-term traffic needs of the corridor. So based on the results of the 200 diversion alternative performed, it, the 200 diversion alternative performed the lowest or second lowest when compared to the screen build alternatives on all but one metric. So I just wanted to take a, a minute to highlight a few of the metrics. So at the system level, the 200 level, excuse me, the 200 diversion alternative barely provides any benefit compared to the no build. You can see the reduction delay is about 3 to 7% in the morning and the PM peak. So and this accounts for all vehicles in the system, and that includes all the general purpose lanes, all the managed lanes, all the ramps, and all the cross streets within the interchanges. So the metric of travel time and speed the 200 diversion alternative again ranked last, with the lowest average speed in the general purpose lanes compared to the other build alternatives. So this table here shows only the general purpose lanes during the peak hours. It's also very important to note that the hot lanes on the inner loop would not achieve a 45 mile or minimum speed required by federal law due to the congestion on the top side of the beltway. So as this alternative does not meet federal requirements, it's not really considered reasonable. Density and level of service. So Traditional traffic analysis measures level of service. Freeway segments are rated failing or level of service F once they exceed a certain density threshold. The 200 diversion alternative will result in the highest percentage of failing lane miles in the study area. And I want to note this data includes both the general purpose lanes and the managed lanes. So next is travel time index. And what travel time index is a metric that evaluates trip reliability. So just as an example, a travel time index of two is considered severe congestion, and it means that the average travel time for a person during that peak hour would be two times more than during uncongested conditions. So another way to look at it is a travel time of two would cut speeds in half. So from 60 miles an hour to 30 miles per hour as an example. The 200 diversion alternative has the second worst travel time index amongst the screen build alternatives and does not provide a reliable trip option on 495 between 95 and 270. And just once again, I want to note, this table reflects only the general purpose lanes. Although, those, uh, hold on, back up. Yep. You say second worst, but it shows that it's improvement versus existing conditions. In other words, if you, if you use the diversion alternative, you would have a better travel time index than exists today in 2040. System-wide, you're correct. So over the 48 miles, if you broke it down, and we can talk a little bit more about that later, if you broke it down to the pieces, it's not everywhere. It's only in the pieces where we have the managed lanes. So you're saying that, that number is the average? It's the average about the, over the 48 miles. All right. So I wanna, next I want to highlight how some travel times in other areas of 495 are significantly impacted under the 200 diversion alternative. So these are movements that could not be accommodated by the diversion alternative. So for example, a person living in Silver Spring near 29 who may work in Northern Virginia, coming home in the evening, their trip time would double, increase by nearly a half hour. For someone who lives in Bethesda who may work over in the New Carrollton area in Prince George's County, they'd see their trip home in the evening increase by more than two and a half times under the diversion alternative. So this is going to cost people many hours of time each work week they could be spending with their families instead of stuck in traffic. Mr. Folden, is yes. that an anecdote or is that based on actual feedback that you've received? What's that? What you just presented and the comments that you just made regarding the travel. That's based on our traffic modeling, okay. the times that they would be stuck in traffic. Okay. 
I'm going to put the invitation out to you now. Anytime you want to travel with me on ICC, let me know, because I use the ICC for the reasons that you've mentioned. And for me, the extra travel time is peace of mind versus sitting on 495 in traffic or if there's a breakdown. Um, so I can appreciate the anecdote, but I really wish we were using actual feedback from the community. And Ms. Choplin, I invite you as well. Anytime you want to ride with me on the ICC and I'm traveling to Baltimore or I'm traveling to Prince George's County, you're welcome to ride with me. Or if you want to come down 270 with me on a Thursday and experience, I leave at 715 in the morning for a 9 a.m. meeting. So the anecdote just doesn't connect to me. I, I, I might would support her comments that uh, I live in Rockville and I go in the morning to come to this meeting over on Kenilworth Avenue or I actually take the ICC, I drive over 270 and it's a red necklace, it's four, you know, or maybe six lanes of red showing and I've got a six minute longer trip if I was going down to the Beltway, six, six mile trip, which going that speed, which is People are speeding over there at 60, but they go 70. So you're making it up in time. And I think the, what the suggestion is, is to, and again, we've had this effort of a purple line that was, you know, rather than widening the beltway, we're going to do the purple, purple line, transit line. But looking at that segment five, matching five on the part in Montgomery County of the beltway, with the ICC, I think that would be effective. That should be one of the alternatives that looks at. The, the part in uh, Prince George's on the Beltway, four, four, two lanes each way, I-270, two lanes each way. But I think that's what people are getting at, to be as sensitive to the environmental impacts and uh, you know, looking at maybe make, looking that option, the five, but linked with the ICC. And that's what I see you need to look at. I had a quick question. I'm sorry. No. Oh, oh, sure. Just, okay. just okay. real quick, if that's okay. So, with the announcement of the American Legion Bridge uh, cooperation with Virginia, uh, are you planning on including rail as part of the expansion of the bridge as well? Uh, there's no anticipation of providing additional width for future travel lanes or rail, similar to the Woodrow Wilson Bridge that allows for HOV travel or transit travel in the widened section. The any new express lanes would allow for that transit travel. I, I'm asking this because Commissioner Sichu, you had just referenced that the Woodrow Wilson Bridge was designed to accommodate yeah. rail. That was a, and that was an environmental, uh, you know, adjustment and to, you know, concession and to make that available. So yes, you can. The 11th and 12th lanes technically are strong enough that you can run metro light rail or use it for exclusively BRT. Uh, maybe in 2050, the bridge needs to be. But again, technology is changing terrifically and where we are with automated cars and all that. And I'm, I'm only asking because if, if we were to extend the purple line to Tyson's, uh, it, it would seem prudent to study whether or not we could actually do that across the Potomac via the bridge and make sure that that bridge could actually be designed to accommodate that. So it's something that we think you should actually look at. I appreciate that comment. Okay. I mean, I will just note yeah. that as a park. So National Park Service certainly uh, would not like that plan of widening the bridge more than absolutely necessary to meet the planned traffic and options in the region. So that's similar to the parks on the north side. They have similar concerns on the south and their parks as well. So I just want to make sure you look at those perspectives as well. But I, I might disagree with you on that. Uh, this is back in the study of uh, 270 coming down River Road. Well, you could run the purple line out river road to the bridge, if that, okay. that could be an option. But I, I think, again, that's very important okay. to have that a transit accommodation on the American Legion Bridge. Okay, let me, let, me, let me sort of say where we are here. I'm told we have about 10 more slides for this part. For the Maryland okay, and then what? Diversion. And then what? The only thing that we had left was we, um, we have been working with Maryland National Staff to further reduce impacts, and we just wanted to highlight those. But if okay, we, we can provide okay. that so to, I to need Carol. For, we're about to lose a quorum, so I need for you to go through this as succinctly as possible. I mean, I'm giving Got you it. like maybe four minutes. Got okay. it. Okay. And, and I'm going to ask that we refrain our questions for now, the, the, the commission. And I'm also going to suggest that it appears to me I could be wrong, but it appears to me we're not, I know you're seeking 
to, um, for us to change our position on the non-concurrence based on the revised ARDS. Um, we may or may not be able to do that today. And part of that is because <laughs> we still need some outstanding information. And I, I have another comment to make, but I'm gonna let you finish your slides first. So, okay. All right, the 200 diversion alternative creates a new bottleneck on the top side of the beltway, just east of the I-270 spur during the morning peak because the extra traffic reaches that non winding section faster, causing spillback toward the American Legion Bridge. So this, altern this bottleneck is not created under any of the other alternatives retained for detailed study. The bottleneck creates significant impacts to the overall system by increasing travel times and contributing to the reduction of moving people across the bridge. Under the 200 diversion alternative, the increase in person throughput across the bridge is less than half of that in the other alternatives with the same number of lanes from the American Legion Bridge to 370. So this shows that not providing the managed lanes on the top side has a direct negative impact on that north-south movement between the bridge and 270. So we talked about some of the negative effects of the I-270 diversion alternative, but we did note some benefit to the north-south roadways in Prince George's County. Through the overall study area metric, the 200 diversion alternative performs well for delay on the local network. However, that improvement's mainly due to the new managed lanes on I-95. When you look at the results in localized areas, improvements only occur in certain areas. So the additional lanes on I-95 pull traffic off of other parallel routes such as US-1 and 650, improving travel on those routes. But without the managed lanes on the top side of the Beltway to pull traffic off the local east-west routes, there's going to remain significant congestion on routes in the Silver Spring, Bethesda areas in Montgomery County, such as 28 Montrose Parkway, Randolph Road, 410. But the biggest impact of the local networks in the District of Columbia, which sees significantly more hours of delay on the district roadways because of traffic cutting through D.C., they can't use the Capitol Beltway. So the 200 diversion has a significant impact on accommodating latent demand. And latent demand many times is misrepresented or confused as induced demand. Induced demand is entirely new travel on the transportation system due to changes to the system. Under our build alternatives, there's less than 1% increase in new vehicle miles traveled when compared to the no build condition. However, latent demand are trips that are occurring already on other routes or other times. They're forced to these other routes or times due to significant congestion on 495 or 270. The 200 diversion alternative only serves 19% of latent demand, compared to 26 to 44% served by the other build alternatives evaluated. The benefits seen from serving the latent demand on the, is less traffic on the local roadways and overall shorter rush hours. So I also wanted to highlight the annual hour, average hours of savings for the alternatives. The 200 diversion alternative would only save the average commuter in the system on 495 and 270 19 hours, which is over three and a half hold, times. Hold on, hold on a second. This distinction you're drawing between induced and latent uh, demand, just to be clear, what you're saying is there's some trips that would get made at some other time, <clears throat> and that's it's good if we can accommodate the demand when people might choose, if given their preference, when to make the trip. Is that right? Okay. Am I, is that an accurate mm -hmm. statement? Sure. So if I want to get my hair cut, I could get my hair cut at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or at 5.30 in the afternoon. What you're saying is it's good if we can provide capacity so I can get my hair cut at 5.30 instead of choosing to do it in the middle of the day when traffic isn't as heavy. Is that correct? That's the logic of what you're saying. I'm saying it's good to give people <coughs> options to get where they need to go when they need to go. So we should accommodate people's travel whenever they might choose to do it, even if they today are making those trips at some other time or by some other route on the existing road network. That's the premise. So we should, we should, we should design transportation infrastructure so people can just travel, everybody can travel at rush hour if that's what they want to do. Is that, is that what you're saying? Saying we should design transportation for demand and the customer's needs. Demand and the customer's needs, whether or not they are actually absorbing the cost of the congestion that they cause as well as the, as the cost of building and maintaining that infrastructure. I'm not sure I get your point there. I mean, they are paying for the infrastructure through their taxes, their you know. tolls or whatever means they're paying for. Okay. So the customer is paying for the highways, the transit, through the gas tax, through titling, licensing, and things of that nature. All right. How many more slides do you have? I yeah, have all right, we can move on. Here. We can. Because Houston, we have a problem here, so. So, so 
There are two main reasons why the 200 diversion alternative will lead to significant congestion noted on the previous slides. It does not address some of the worst performing roadway segments in Maryland, and the ICC cannot accommodate traffic to provide relief. And I'm just going to hit. So the top of the Capitol Beltway is the most congested segment in the morning in Maryland today. It's been that way since 2011, at least. It's going back before the ICC opened. So we would not be addressing this most congested segment and other segments in this area. And the ICC's purpose was to handle traffic in 2030 at a free flow speed. So after it opened, the ICC has continued to grow as people have seen the benefits of it. It's functioning as it was intended when it was originally designed, and it's projected to meet its 2030 projections that it was projected to when it opened. Certain sections of the ICC are expected to reach capacity in 2027, 20, and those sections are westbound, the same direction where the Capitol Beltway is significantly congested today. So the ICC doesn't have the ability to accommodate more traffic on the top side of the Capitol Belt from the excuse me from the top side of the Capitol Beltway in the future. Okay. Okay. Let me just say this real quick because we have a lot of concerns here, and I know you're asking us to to change our um, recommendation, our, our position of non concurrence based on on your revised um, ARDS. But I'm not sure we have enough information. I'm. I, we can either postpone or we can either go or vote right now as to, um, you know, to, to maintain our position or, or, or change the position, whatever the motion is. Um, and then we can still continue to work with you. We will continue to work with you, assuming that you continue to work with us and our team. I'm, I'm, we will delve in earnest to see if we can get you some more um, assistance. But I have to go. Madam Chair? I, yeah, no. I, Okay, I, 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 we are all professionals here, are our, our, um, there and right here, and then we and we have a tremendous concerns for our populations in our over two million by county area, now, and plus the people who pass through, and we have a tremendous responsibility. And sometimes I don't, and, and it's really hard to tick me off, um, and I'm not getting the impression that. That you're really hearing and address hearing our concerns, and I'm going to go back for a second. We sent you a letter on June the 12th that was very professional, and it outlined our concerns in very reasonable, intelligent, professional terms. On June 28th, you all sent us a response which I thought was tremendously offensive. I cannot tell you how many times that you said, we don't understand, we don't have a basic understanding of NEPA. It shows our lack of understanding of everything. Um, and then it talks about the segmentation and implementation. And you go on to define that in terms of uh, NEPA and the federal uh, F FHWA. And, um, um, you go on to explain that and that it has to be the terminus and the segmentation has to be logical and therefore that is why you stop at certain places in Montgomery County and that is why you stop at Branch Avenue in Prince George's County. So then it all turns on a definition of, of what's reasonable and what's logical because what you think is legion, reasonable and logical may not be what we think is reasonable and logical and we can respectfully disagree but don't come at us and tell us that we don't know what we're talking about we don't understand anything and we don't have we have a basic lack of understanding all those different terms that you use for us are highly offensive when we are doing our job don't ever write us a letter like that again never it was very demeaning when we're trying to do our job on behalf of our respective counties and all two plus million of the people who reside in them. Don't ever write us a letter like that again. Um, it is it, highly offensive and therefore we felt the need to respond. And I know, um, I, I'm looking at the author of the letter, so you're right here in front of us. Uh, you know, I hope you look at it again, Ms. Chaplin, and, and, and ensure that you never ever submit anything like that to us again. We were willing to sit down and work with you some more, um, but not if you're going to be condescending. It's a lack of understanding of NEPA policy, fundamental lack of understanding of just about everything, inappropriate, um, um, you know, you talked about segmentation. I mean, everything you wrote in there was demeaning. And we won't tolerate that when we're trying to do our job. Um, so I don't know. I'm going to turn to uh, Mr. Vice Chair, and I'm going to see if there's. I, I just had a suggestion. Okay. Okay. Um, from what I've heard today, number one, 
the Virginia's participation, which I've heard characterized as a breakthrough, as a game changer, actually amounts to no more than an agreement for Virginia to do what the project team assumed was going to be happening from the outset of the project. So it's basically changed nothing. That's the first thing I've learned. Second thing I've learned is that alternatives have been rejected, not because they don't address congestion in any way. They maybe address congestion and some of the other project purposes and needs less than some of the more aggressive or ambitious alternatives. But I don't think for NEPA purposes that that's a basis for rejecting those alternatives, particularly the diversion alternative, which by some measures actually improves uh, overall congestion levels and travel time throughout the relevant part of the transportation network compared to what it is today, even assuming 2040 um, traffic growth. Third thing I think I've learned today is that uh, we are still without a factual basis to evaluate many of the assertions that the project team has made about why certain alternatives are viable or not viable or desirable or undesirable, whether or not they meet the purpose and need. So for all those reasons, particularly the second and third, I would suggest that we vote, uh, take a vote, and my recommendation would be that we affirm our original position not concurring in the, uh, in the proposed. Uh, Is that your arts. motion? That's my motion. And I'll second. second. Okay, we got two seconds. Um, is there a discussion? I'm glad you said that because one of the things, the, the lack of information, we need some information. And in your letter, that's another thing you mentioned over and over again. We have given this information to your staff multiple, multiple, multiple times. Well, we still don't have all the information. So you can't say that everything was provided to us multiple times because it wasn't. Okay. So, um, and the other thing. Yes? You asked if there was discussion. I do have one discussion yes. item. Yes. It'll be very quick. Mr. Folden, if you do come back um, regarding the ICC diversion alternative, I would ask that you would consider um, in, in terms of your economic analysis how the ICC is one of the most expensive tollways in the DMV area. The Greenway is probably more expensive. And we also know that Governor Hogan had presented about three years ago that there was a, going to be a decrease in the toll rates, which has been done. But for those who peel back the layers, like I did a couple of years ago as a facilitator, this is a temporary fix. And we know that the prices are going up again at some point. What I would like to see in your diversion alternative why it was considered um, to not be a, a viable alternative if we, one, increase the traffic speeds on ICC to 65. So for those who are traveling east, when they merge on to 95, they would actually merge on at the same speed that the people who are traveling on 95, which is also 65 miles per hour. My other question is, does your alternative have any impact or have you had any consultation with MDTA regarding uh, the ICC since M ICC is part of the MDTA M portfolio? Um, there's a lot of information that's missing right now, so I, I'm, that's my comment for now. Okay. But I, I would like to see that if you talk about this alternative again. And please don't share an anecdote until you've either ridden with someone or you have actually been on the ICC during traffic time. I can appreciate it's based on a model, but that's not what's happening in the real world. Okay. Um, again, we do appreciate your coming here today. We're sorry we didn't have more time. We have a motion on the floor. Um, which, and I will call for the vote momentarily. Um, um, but you see, we have issues here. And our issues are legitimate issues. You may not agree with them, but they cannot be dismissed. Um, all in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. It's unanimous. We'll continue to work with you. The one thing you did say um, was, well, one of the things you did say was that the relationship is improving, the communication is improving. It's not there enough. Let's keep moving in that right direction and maybe we'll get there. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we need, um, pursuant to section 3-305B7 uh, of the General Provisions Article of the Annotated Code of Maryland, we need a motion to go into closed session. So move. Second. Um, discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Who's, uh, who's, do you have to leave now? I know, but she has to go too. What?